going to start with, uh, let me set this up. Okay. <clears throat> Today is October the 30th, 2022. I'm going to start, uh, with, I'm going to continue with the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, in which the uh, uh, letter is written to the two churches, the church of Ephesus and the church of Smyrna. So let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to be here one more time to share your word. Give us your wisdom, your inspiration, and your strength so we can uh, convey the word to the people who are present here and people who are watching in their homes. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So let me read the text, and then we're going to go verse by verse. Let's start to the church of Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have preserved and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen, Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You, ha you ha hate the practices of uh, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Then to the church of Smyrna, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, <clears throat> who died and came life to, to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution from 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay, this is the text. All right, so let's go to the next page. And uh, we <coughs> have seen that uh, in chapter number one, <coughs> the angel of... Uh, of God appears to John and instructs John to uh, write a letter to the seven churches. And the seven churches addressed in chapter 2 and 3 were actual churches in John's day. But they also represent types and conditions of churches in all generations. The idea is supported by the fact that only seven were selected out of the many that existed and flourished in John's time. And by the statement at the close of each letter, the spirit was speaking to the church. So there were seven selected because they were the best ones, according to that, and also the spirit gives a message to those seven churches. The seven letters, with minor exceptions, are organized in the following general pattern. One, a description of Christ derived from the vision of chapter one, which we just reviewed now. A commendation of the congregation, <clears throat> a rebuke for his spiritual deficiencies, a correction for his wrong, and a promise to overcome it. So when they analyze the church, they said, you are good. However, this is what you're doing wrong. And you gotta correct it. And then if you do correct it, you're gonna have a, a victor's crown. These seven assemblies of churches are examples of the kind of churches that exist throughout history. This means that all seven letters are warnings to every church in every age. So even though there were seven churches directed to, at that time, those churches represent all churches throughout history. So, let's start with verse number one. Edward, can you read number one? Verse number one, please. To the, to the angel of the church of, in Ephesus write, <clears throat> These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lamps. Yes. Let's start to the angel of the church. Here, as in other letters, the churches are addressed through their representative angel. The point of this seems to remind the churches that their primary existence is spiritual and that they have help ready for them in heaven. 
In this light, it is implicit that the church on earth is to model its worship on what's taking place now in heaven. Now, uh, I always say that most of the problems that we have in life, the root of the problems is spiritual. Almost all of them are spiritual. Okay? If you analyze, it's because you all get away with God, from God. And you know that for God, you know, to God nothing is impossible. So whatever problem you have, first take it, take it to Christ. And it says here, Ephesus. Ephesus was the most important city <clears throat> in Asia Minor when Revelation was written. And the Caesar Augustus, it became the capital of a Roman province called Asia, which today is the western port portion of Turkey. It was a residence of the Apostle John before and after his exile to Patmos. The city was a great seaport and also was a commercial, political, and religious center. It, it was the center of the worship of Artemis, or Diana, the goddess of fertility. Christ comes to the Ephesians as the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, that is, as one intimately aware of all that is going on in the churches. Okay, um, seven churches, if you can see that, Edward, this is the map of the seven churches, right. okay? And you can see uh, on the left-hand side is the island of Patmos. That's where uh, the Apostle John was exiled to. And the seven churches are right across in the province of Asia, all right? Mm -hmm. So you have an idea what uh, geographically where they are. So let me, let me uh, read uh, verse two. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I know your deeds. This is the thing that um, uh, Christ always says to the churches. I know your deeds. I know what you are. I know what you're doing. So he's always present. He's omnipresent. Uh, it's a phrase that appears in each letter as a statement of recognition of, from the omniscient, which is an infinite awareness, an omnipresent judge. And then he says, I know you cannot tolerate wicked, wicked people. So he's telling the church the good things that they're doing. The efficient church is first commended for having tested and rebuked those false teachers that often appear disguised as angel of light. Okay, let's go to verse three. Uh, Romain, how are you doing? Okay, there are three words in here, persevere, endure, have not grown weary. These are qualities that produce character and maturity as a believer faces trials and suffering. The church has persevered in guarding the internal doc doctrinal purity of the church's faith, yet has not grown weary. Let's go to verse four, Nico. Yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken the love you know, most of the churches, when they start, they start small. And they have this zeal, this incentive, this uh, uh, force that you want to please the Lord, okay? But sometimes when this church becomes bigger and bigger, other things call your attention, you know? And then you leave your first love. And I am sure those mega churches, some of them, I guess, when they got so big and they had so many activities, that the first love, which is Christ, kind of disappears. So this is what happened to this church, Ephesus. When Paul was there, you know, a generation before, there was a, a great church. The whole province, the whole area was influenced by the church of Ephesus. But now this is a second generation. And the kind of, uh, they, they go into other things, you know. Uh, in history, for example, the, uh, uh, the people that went to World War II, it's called the greatest generation. But the sons and daughters, are the hippies they rebel against everything authority you know and now we have the uh, other people that are you know children of the hippies but uh, the second generation doesn't necessarily follow what the first generation uh, you children sometimes don't follow what your parents teach you okay uh, so that's very unfortunate all right so let's go uh, yeah verse four so it says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. This implies an intentional, not accidental act. More than 30 years before, this church had been commended for its love. Most were second generation Christians whose purity of doctrine and endurance in service were unquestioned. But 
they have abandoned that eagerness to please and devotion that characterizes the first love. So the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. They had lost the love they had for one another and not for Christ. Leaving the first love means a great diminishing of the church's initial love. And probably also means that they had lost their passion for the message of the gospel. Losing the first love was the same as becoming witnesses with a lack of zeal. Doesn't that happen also in marriage? Sometimes marriage, you get married and the first time, you know, it's great, but then that's why divorce is so prevalent. You get away from God. Okay, we're going to go to verse 5. Uh, Edward, please. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Okay, sometimes uh, you get involved in a sin, and uh, since you are so emotionally involved, sometimes you cannot see what's right in front of you. It needs another person who was his, who's uh, looking from the outside, who's subjective, and look at the problem and tells you what the problem is. I remember years ago, I was uh, involved in uh, something that was not Christian. And um, you get so involved and you continue, you know? And then a friend of mine called me from, I haven't talked to him in years, calls me, yeah, you do it. And as we were talking, I was telling him, and he deducted that I was not doing something right. So he said, you're not doing some, you know, you're not doing it right. So let's pray on the phone. So he prayed for me on the phone. And after that, things happened that I got away from that situation that was not uh, Christian. So sometimes an objective person, a person from outside, can see better than what you cannot see. All right? So, uh, so, so the, the angel is telling that church, repent. So this is speaks, uh, he tells you, know, you have fallen so far that you don't even see it. This is speaks of a considerable drop off of love in the Ephesian church. The Ephesians were to remember and consider how far they had fallen in the loss of the first law, and to return to do the things you did at first. A reference to those days in which the entire province of Asia heard the word of the Lord through Paul and the Ephesian church. Therefore, it is possible that the Ephesians leaving the first law refers to the lack of dependence of the Spirit, which was necessary for an effective witness. And then he said, repent. Repent means to change one's thinking. It's clearly connected with change behavior. The Ephesian Christians were to regain the lifestyle that they had before they departed from their first love. If they do not respond, Jesus himself will come in judgment and the church of Ephesus will be no more. The actual warning, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, indicates the removal of the church as a light of witness to the world, which points to the removal of it before Christ's final coming, since the church's witness is a relevant activity only before Advent, not afterward. What does that mean? It means the role of the church is to preach the word, is to educate believers, and to share the word with the world while we are alive. Once we're dead, forget it, the church is more. Okay? So on this side of paradise, we have work to do. Okay? But when Christ comes, our, our work is over. When we are taken in the rapture, our work is over. So let's do the most we can do what we can. Because there's going to come a time when uh, Christ comes and uh, our job is going to be finished. Okay? It says here, uh, church's witness is a relevant activity only before the final advent. Advent is the second coming, not afterwards. After the second coming, we're, we're done. Though the Lord will return in a final sense at the end of history, he comes regularly to visit his church in this present age, both to encourage and to judge. So Christ is present, coming to our churches and tell us what's wrong with our churches, okay? And also to encourage us. You know, you are doing, you are suffering, but, you know, keep doing it. Suffering breeds character. You, you grow spiritually by suffering, unfortunately. Okay, um, verse 6. Remark, Romain. Okay, despite their shortcomings, this church is commended for not tolerating the Nicolaitans as they have not tolerated the false apostles. The Nicolaitans were a heretical act or sect within the church that had worked out to compromise 
a compromise with the pagan society and probably thought the Christians could participate in the idolatrous culture of Ephesus. They apparently thought that the spiritual liberty gave them sufficiency or sufficient leeway to practice idolatry and immorality. Now, this happens in every age. When Solomon was king, he was dedicated to the Lord. But then he started marrying foreign wives. And these foreign wives have foreign gods. And then he started building temples to the foreign gods. And he would say, well, I know I'm, I'm building temples to the foreign gods, but I also pray to my God. So I'm OK. It's like saying, you know, uh, I go to church every, every Sunday, but I can go to bars throughout the week. You know, I get drunk. You know, as long as I go to church, no, it doesn't work like that. You know, sin is sin. Sin separates you from God, no matter where you are. Okay? There is no, yeah. I have a little problem with, with Santa Claus and Christmas. You know, What's the matter? Don't you believe in Santa Claus? What's wrong with you? No, I'm just saying with, with like, uh, the church that I go to, we're going to have a Christmas party, a Christmas celebration, and with the little children. And I want them to emphasize. I don't even want Santa Claus there because it's about Jesus. But a lot of people don't agree with me, not even my wife agrees with me, so I, I don't know. But I, well, for me, that's um, a compromise with the world, and saying, well, you know, Santa, Christmas is not about Santa Claus, it's about Jesus. As a, as a Christian, your duty and responsibility is to know the truth, okay? As long as you know the truth, you can take the lie a little bit, you know? Even though you don't participate in the lie, you can say, listen, this is not it. But you, you know, Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. It was not. This we don't know. Yeah, okay. No, it, it was born in either September or October. Okay, and uh, 25th of December was a pagan holiday, which was Saturnalia, and the Romans put it. So starting from that, uh, and then in, in Christmas the uh, the Magi gave presents to Jesus. We don't get presents to each other. So the whole thing is wrong. Okay, but knowing that, you know, and knowing the culture and the tree and Santa Claus and all that, knowing the truth. You can tell people who ask you what the truth is, and you tell them the truth. But if you're going to start telling everybody, no, you're going to go against, you know. I mean, I remember when I was working uh, in this office, and uh, we're going to have a big party. Uh, Santa Claus is going to come, and he's going to go do a striptease in a Christmas party. And then we had booths and all that in a Christmas party in the office. Uh, what's that to do with Jesus? Now, you as a Christian see all that, and uh, either you walk out, or just uh, you know, participate that minimum, okay? But if they ask you, this is all wrong. If you can do it, go ahead, you know. But uh, I know I know what you're going to. Okay. So in going to the to the to the verse six, the city was dominated by the cult of the goddess Artemis. Artemis or Diana. Artemis is the uh, the Greeks. Diana from the Roman goddess of fertility. And her temple had thousands of priests and priestesses with heavy involvement in prostitution. The city had also been declared a temple warden of two temples dedicated to the imperial cult, worship of Caesar, which meant that this cult also played an essential part in the city's life. Therefore, the church's resistance to internal pressure to accommodate aspects of this idolatrous society was very commendable. You know, when, the, when Israel was given the promised land and went to the promised land, they were told by God, don't mingle with the people there. Don't associate with them because they, they worship other gods. And if you associate with them, you're going to get influenced by them. Okay? It's the same thing. If you associate with unbelievers, well, we live among unbelievers, right? Wherever we go, they're unbelievers. But you don't socialize there continually because you might get affected or influenced by them. All right? And in this case, you know, uh, one of their goddess, though these unbelievers, involved prostitution. So you, you go to the temple, and prostitution was part of the uh, worship of the gods. So that's why it became very popular with the uh, Israelites. Oh, I like that, you know? But of course, it was abomination to the Lord, right? But if you, if you associate with people that are unbelievers, eventually you're going to be influenced by those people, okay? Now you can be there, and you can be an influence to them. But you better watch out. You know, you measure your uh, your time with them. Okay, don't participate or start laughing at the jokes that are you know without language. There's no reason for it. All right, let's go to verse seven. 
Nico? Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay, whoever has ears. This is what um, the prophet said in the, uh, in the Old Testament. When the God talked to the prophets, he would tell them, go and preach to the people and tell them, whoever has ears, hear. You know? So he said, whoever has ears, let me hear. It's reminiscent of Jesus' warnings to his listeners to give in the parable of the sower. The letter, this letter concludes with a clause which occurs in all seven letters and was used by Jesus, who was quoting for Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. He who has, hear, who has an ear, let him hear. The primary function of the prophets who lived toward the end of Israel's history was to warn Israel of its impending doom and divine judgment. He was telling Israel, if you don't repent, you're going to be punished. And exactly there, another the Babylonians came and they sent them to exile. And first were the Assyrians. Jesus' teaching, like the, that of the prophets, is meant to enlighten believers while further hardening unbelievers. Like Israel, the church has also become compromising and a spiritual lethargy. You're talking about Christmas. They compromise that holiday, you know? It has nothing to do with the Bible. It has entertained idolatrous allegiances. The use of the various pictures and images throughout the book of Revelation, like beasts, dragons, harlots, horsemen, strange creatures, plagues, and so on, is meant to shock believers out of the complacency and the danger of compromising with idolatrous culture in which they live. It also pertains to us too. Meanwhile, unbelievers will fail to understand what God is saying to them and will sink further into unbelief. To some, of course, may be rich and safe. Well, isn't that no different from what we have right now? You know, most of the people are unbelievers, you know, and uh, the more you preach, you encourage a believer, but the unbeliever, they still get in the way from it. You know, yeah, yeah, that's right, sure, go. You know, whatever turns you on, you know, more and more are unbelievers. You know, when I, uh, when I was younger and I, uh, I was watching television, you never heard a four-letter word there. Now all the comedians almost use four-letter words like a, the most natural thing, and people accept it. And that's not right. That's not right. We, as Christians, had to keep our integrity. When the Spirit of God speaks to the churches, he is representing Christ. For he is the Spirit of Christ who guides believers in all, to, all, to all truth and does not speak on his own authority. To the one who is victorious, the challenge to be victorious is a battle against evil and that occurs in every letter and is directed to every believer who perseveres in obedience and is victorious in the face of trial. Now, some commentators express three main views about the nature of the, the overcoming, overcomer or victorious. The first view is that the promise to the overcomer is experienced by all believers. In other words, all genuine believers are overcomers. Bless you. And failure to overcome means that uh, there was no true salvation in that person's case. That's one view. Second view holds that the promises are experienced only by those believers who are faithful and obedient. And failure to overcome means that there was being a loss of salvation. The third view is that the promises are experienced only by believers who are faithful and obedient, and failure to overcome means a loss of rewards, not salvation. Taking all into account, the third view is more likely. Now, what are we saying here? We're saying that we as believers have been born again. Our salvation is secure, okay? So when we come to judgment, it's going to be about rewards, not about salvation, because in heaven, it's going to be levels of rewards. I, I assume in hell, it's going to be levels of punishment. A person who did not care about Christ and went to hell, I don't think he had the same punishment as Hitler or Stalin that were mass murderers. I, I'm speculating, and that's true. Okay? That's not biblical. I'm just speculating. Now, he says here, well, I say that there are levels of rewards in heaven. It's possible. I'm sure there is, you know, because we are going to get rewards which are probably different from Apostle Paul or the martyrs, I think. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. Eating of the tree of life is a promise of special intimacy with the Lord, a promise of renewing the fellowship lost before the fall. The privilege once denied to Adam will be enjoyed by the overcomer or victorious in the faith. Paradise was paradise. Originally, a Persian world, it was a Persian world for a pleasure garden. 
It is the place Jesus told the believing thief he would go after his death on the cross. Paul uses the term interchangeable with the third heaven. In Revelation, it symbolizes the eschatological, which means relating to the end of the world, a state in which God and believers are restored to the perfect fellowship that existed before sin entered the world. So we are promised a paradise. Even before sin entered the world, there was a paradise. That's our promise. We're going to be restored to that state. Uh, verse 8. Uh, Edward? To the angel of the church in Sumera, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Okay, this is the second church he's writing to. Smyrna was an important seaport 35 miles north of Ephesus, called Izmir today. The presence of a Roman imperial cult and emperor worship plus a large Jewish population made life, life difficult for believers in Smyrna. He said the first and the last. Again, Christ introduces himself with an element of the initial vision, which suits the situation in this church, members of which are facing persecution and possible death. He is a divine sovereign over history that alone possesses the attribute of eternity. There is nothing impossible for God. Verse 9, Romain. Okay, he's encouraging the, the church. He said, I know you're going through a lot of trials and tribulations, but be strong, keep on doing because there's light at the end of the tunnel, there's a promise, a price for you. Even though the church is suffering economic hardship, their faithfulness in the face of such affliction demonstrates that they are spiritually rich. Although there will yet there will yet be great tribulation and parallel in history, believers must expect to suffer much tribulation even in the present age. Christians hindered by affliction and poverty in this life can take consolation in the fact that they possess great spiritual riches in Christ. The mention of Jewish slander or, or lie or blasphemy suggests that Jews, some of the Jews, jealous of the inroads Christianity was making, may have informed on the Christians to the Roman authorities. And in the latter part of the first century, Christianity enjoyed a degree of protection and the umbrella of Judaism, which was an acceptable religion to Rome. The Jews were not forced to worship Caesar as a god, but were allowed to offer sacrifice in order of emperors as rulers, not as gods. But after the ne Neronian persecution, Christianity was increasingly seen as distinct from Judaism and ceased to enjoy protection under its umbrella. It then came under suspicion, since new religions were not acceptable in the empire. So the false accusations against the saints, which induced oppression, identified the Jews as a synagogue of Satan, which means false accuser, since this is also a characteristic trait of the beast in persecuting God's people. Apostate Jews in Smyrna were in reality instruments of Satan. Verse 10, Nico. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even the point of death, of death and I will give you life as your future crown. Okay, the first sentence says, uh, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The church of Smyrna is exhorted not to fear such economic and political persecution, even if it takes the harsher forms of imprisonment and capital punishment, as it sometimes did. In fact, Christ tells them to brace for more severe punishment. The reason that they not, are not to fear the imminent trial is that their lives and destiny are in the hands of the eternal Lord of history. We have to remember that. Who has already experienced persecution, even to death, and yet overcome, overcome it through resurrection. He said, you will suffer persecution for 10 days. This may refer to a 10-day period of intense persecution to come, or it might indicate 10 periods of persecution from the emperors nearer to the occlusion. The Smyrnans will undergo this brief but severe period of trial. Christians in general come from time to time expect to undergo periods of persecution. Then it talks about victor's crown, the reward of one who is faithful under trial, one to death. Crown does not refer to a royal crown, 
but to the garland of wreath awarded to the winner in a telekic contest. James 1.12 also promises a crown of life to believers who persevere in the trial. Such perseverance will result in the ultimate enjoyment of life in God's kingdom. Let me read the last verse, verse 11. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all but the second death. So Christ alone, the first and the last, holds the keys of death and is alive forever. The Spirit here is telling the churches to hold on to the final ironic victory, wherein the years of defeat of death is heavenly victory and life. Similarly, the saints conquering is also based on the pattern introduced in 2.8, where Christ's death is, led, is said to lead to the resurrected life. So if Christ resurrected, we are going to be resurrected. Then to the one who is victorious, pertains to believers who die because of the faith and are rewarded with life, ruled with Christ, and are protected from the second death, which is eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. The devil is given power to cast them in the physical prison and put them to death. However, this power is limited because he himself has already been cast into a spiritual prison. Christ's resurrection gave him power over the entire sphere of death. He now has the keys of death in Hades, which enabled him both to bind the satanic prince of the realm and to protect his own people from his ultimate harmful effects. Now, let me tell you a few things about this. Okay? Second day. Now, first of all, the letter was written to two churches, Ephesus and Smyrna. The first two letters. Remember that uh, map I gave you? Okay, the first two letters, clock, clockwise. Ephesus is, is, tell, is told, you were great before, but now you have gotten so big that you forgot your first love. You gotta go back to the first one. It's like you're being married. I mean, you were married, you were in love, and now you're separated. That's not right. You gotta go back to your first love. You gotta go back to that, okay? And you're doing things good, but if you forget your first love, that's not good. Smyrna, they don't, he doesn't criticize Smyrna. He says, you're doing fine. Keep on doing what you're doing. I know you're going to persecution, I know you're done, but remember, you're gonna get that victor's crown, okay? Now, let me tell you something else about this. In the Old Testament, Okay? We have, of course, believers and unbelievers. The, unbe the unbeliever, believers, uh, be unbelievers, they will go, when they die, they will go to a place called Hades or Sheol. Okay? Everybody will go to that place. But Sheol or Hades had two compartments. One was called Abraham's bosom, which was the good part, and the other part was the place of torment, which was the bad part. In the parable Lazarus, and the rich man, Lazarus, goes to the good part, and the rich man goes to the good part, okay? All the unbelievers that die in the Old Testament, all, all the believers that die in the, in the Old Testament went to the good part. All the unbelievers went to the place of torment. When Christ died on the cross, he went to Hades and took all those believers in the good part and took him to glory. But the unbelievers remain in the place of torment. In the New Testament, believers that die we go immediately with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But the unbelievers go to hell, go to the place of torment. All these people, unbelievers, will remain in the place of torment until the final judgment. The final judgment, believers will go to heaven, unbelievers will go to a lake of fire. So the Hades of hell is a, tempo, is a temporary place. Okay, and paradise is also a temporary place. Our final place is heaven, and the final place for unbelievers is lake of fire, okay? Um, so, the next thing that's gonna happen to the church is gonna be the rapture. Rapture is gonna be, the whole church is gonna be taken away from here, okay? Where it's gonna happen today, tomorrow, or a thousand years from now, we don't know, okay? But the rapture, when the rapture is gonna be taken away, from, the church is taken away in the, the Holy Spirit is taken away from there. And only unbelievers will remain. But some are going to preach the, the gospel, the uh, two witnesses. And some will come to Christ. The Holy Spirit is not there, but if you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit will come to the believer. Because you accepted Christ. Okay? And then will come the, the tribulation. Of course, in, in that environment where nobody believes in God, the, the Antichrist is going to rise. Of course, they're going to rise. Everybody's going to believe him. Because there are no. There are no People, God's people, they're going to say, that's the Antichrist. No, because they don't believe in God. And they, he's going to become very popular, 
and the first three and a half years of uh, seven year is going to be very good, peace all over the world. And the second three and a half years, he's going to reveal his true colors and he's going to persecute everybody. Okay? So, this is what. Uh, now, next week, we're going to be analyzing all the letters and to the other churches. There are different ways, but remember when he's talking to these churches, those churches are now different from the churches that we have right now, only a little different. So, those seven churches are the same as the churches that are here or have existed throughout history. All right? Do you have any questions? Yes? Uh, next week, can I, can I get you on Zoom or something? With that? Recorded. Yeah, sure. Okay. You can you can go to Zoom right now and uh, okay. see me here and okay. see you here. But it'd be recorded. I can see. It is recorded good. already. It's, it's been recorded. Good. Good. Now, if you give me if you, if you give me your email, yeah. I will mail you this okay. the lesson. Good. Okay, so you can write your email here. Okay. 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 Any questions, Nico? How are you feeling? I heard you were sick on Thursday. Yeah. They canceled the. Uh, yeah, it's because Israel was sick and commune couldn't come, so it would have been just me, Roman, and and, and me, and you, and uh, Jonathan. So he said, "Oh, he canceled." He canceled. He canceled. So I was there. Anyway, all right. So uh, we're gonna close this with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to be here one more time, and to share the word of God with you. Uh, with believers, dear Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your wisdom, your uh, patience, your strength, your, your endurance, dear Lord, so we continue with these uh, lessons every Sunday. Uh, let the rest of the day be a blessed day, and let also the rest of the week will be a blessed week. Thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us in our daily basis. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So okay, let, me, let, me, let me finish this.